The leaders of the United States, Japan and South Korea met in Camp David, a traditional site for high-stakes diplomacy. What is on the agenda at a time when tensions are rising in East Asia? A South African court has ordered that the government disclose contracts it signed with various entities, including big pharma companies, for COVID-19 vaccines. Why is this verdict important for South Africa and the rest of the world? And finally, we are at the final stage of the FIFA Women's World Cup. Spain and England are the contesting teams for the championship. What have been the highlights so far? This is Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. U.S. President Joe Biden held a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and South Korean President Yoon suk yeol at Camp David on Friday. Now, out of the meeting came a host of steps to strengthen ties between these countries, who have anyway been moving closer in recent times. The meeting gained significance as East Asia and the Pacific region has been increasingly militarized, and Japan and South Korea are both ruled by right-wing parties. So, what came out of this summit and what can we expect in the coming months? We are with us, Anish. Anish, thank you for joining us. So, first of all, we've been uh, looking forward in some senses to this meeting. We've had a couple of shows before where we mentioned this as well. So, what were the major conclusions of this summit at Camp David? Yeah, so it's broadly two uh, pretty much uh, ideas that they want to bring up, which is one is to uh, basically condemn uh, China and North Korea. And the other is to uh, to you know, uh, and reinforce their commitment, their prior commitments of uh, pushing for a stronger military alliance. Now, the thing is that the statement, there hasn't been a joint statement yet, but uh, what we still have is uh, a very vague set of uh, understanding, which isn't really new. We haven't seen anything new from what they have said in previous meetings, but we've, we've seen similar meetings in Seoul and in Tokyo. And uh, in all of these cases, there hasn't been much... Uh, difference uh, from what they have actually said to, uh, said in earlier statements. Uh, but what we do understand is this is basically their attempt to create a new set of, uh, to reinforce their force and to uh, a show of strength in uh, of sorts uh, in, the, in the region especially. And U.S. trying to show off that it has two major allies in the East right now. Now, uh, the problem that comes with this is that when you when we think Camp David, it's uh, usually used for like for historic summits. Now, this is something that the U.S. has been trying very hard to uh, push for, like to uh, or at least the Biden administration has been trying to push this as some kind of a historic uh, summit uh, between three nations. Uh, but what we are seeing is something uh, not very different from what has actually happened and it needn't be, uh, you know, uh, advertised in, uh, in the manner that it did. Uh, because uh, some of the things like they actually made some more significant stuff, uh, decisions, including uh, South Korea talking about having a, a sort of military uh, deal uh, with Japan, which is not something very different. Uh, what they did uh, and US is not necessary in that situation either, but definitely this is part of it. Uh, and obviously they're uh, doubling down on their uh, you know provocations against China and North Korea in the situation and uh, we see uh, them talking about aggressive behavior of these two countries in the Asia Pacific. Uh, when we look at the fact that uh, the more aggressive uh, military drills that uh, US has conducted in the region, especially across the DMZ uh, in the last uh, couple of months itself, uh, it's uh, that itself clearly shows the level of aggression that US and uh, its allies has been conducting in the region. So obviously these factors definitely come in. So what we're looking at is essentially just the same wine in a new bottle. Right. And in context, I think important to also look at the fact that, uh, you know, the United States has always had an alliance, a very strong alliance with Japan. It has had a very strong alliance with South Korea at various points. <clears throat> you know, the lot of the politics in these countries has been influenced by the US. But South Korea and Japan themselves have not really always had a very strong relationship. In fact, there have been there's been quite substantial tension between these countries because of various historical incidents, the, you know, the legacy of World War II, the Japanese imperialism that took place. So, it's not that these two countries have had a very strong relationship. So, is that been has that been changing in recent times? 
I mean, definitely what we are looking at the, uh, under the current uh, conservative administration in South Korea in, from Seoul uh, under Yoon suk yeol it's pretty much uh, like a, a, what the mainstream media would say, like attempts at thawing uh, a strained relation. But it's not necessarily what we're looking at, like prior to that, uh, it didn't exist. Like the kind of strained relation that they're talking about is basically South Korea taking a very more, more pragmatic set of steps uh, when it comes to A, its own national interest and B, its historic grievances of its own citizens. And uh, so that is something that uh, is very often uh, now not playing a major role uh, when it comes to South Korea's uh, dealings with Japan. Now, something very in, important that we need to talk about, like obviously we spoke about uh, the reparations, uh, the matter of reparations of uh, imperialist crimes uh, in the Korean Peninsula and uh, how the two living survivors who still have their cases in uh, Korean courts have, are still, uh, you know, continue to fight uh, for those reparations. Uh, but the uh, South Korean government has actually given uh, the Japanese, um, you know, a way out with a new fund of its sorts where it will be uh, Koreans who will be paying for Japanese war crimes. But that aside, uh, uh, in a couple of days, we're looking at uh, a very possible uh, release uh, of Fukushima, uh, Fukushima's contaminated waters uh, by Japan. And this is something that a lot of Koreans are quite divided about. Not divided, most of them are actually quite opposed to it, especially the people uh, on the coast uh, the fishing community, and not just the South Koreans, also the Japanese, but definitely this has been a major issue in Korea. The government had to run multiple uh, consultation sessions, uh, you know, where they try to apparently advise people how it is safe and whatever, trying to convince their own citizen about another country's deeds. And this is something that you do not see very much, even even with the most friendliest of countries. So in this case, South Korean uh, state at the current moment, the government is not really taking it, the concerns of its citizenry as seriously, especially when it comes to Japan. So this, you know, rush to actually just bury the hatchet and, you know, create some kind of solid uh, a military political alliance with a, a, a former imperialist is something that is quite tenacious. And so even though you have a very pro-Japanese uh, government at the at, uh, at, in power, a large part of South Koreans do not really view some of these policies very favorably. And that is something that is uh, not, you know, given as much coverage as it should be uh, right now in the mainstream media. Right, Anish, thank you so much for talking to me. We'll keep tracking this issue. Very significant, I think, also because it shows that the U.S. continuing to make sure that it has a strong presence in the Korean Peninsula, in Asia, Pacific, in, you know, the Pacific region as a whole. Of course, people might ask why it should have such a strong presence, but that's definitely a larger question. So thank you so much for talking to us. In a crucial judgment, a court in South Africa has ordered the government to disclose contracts signed with key pharma giants for COVID-19 vaccines. The companies in question include Pfizer, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, and also suppliers from India, China, and the global vaccine initiative COVAX. The ruling came after a petition from an NGO called Health Justice Initiative. Now, the NGO said that it wanted to examine the legality and cost-effectiveness of such agreements. To know more about this case and its relevance, we go to Jyotsna. Jyotsna, thank you so much for joining us. Very interesting verdict from the South African court asking the government to disclose all these details. The NGO asking that they want to examine the legality of these uh, contracts that have been signed with various companies. So, could you tell us why this is significant, specifically in the South African context? You have written about this. We have talked a lot about the kind of contracts that were made at that time. Many of them shouted in secrecy, big pharma giants often benefiting. Yes, thank you, Prashant. So, uh, this verdict, if I just can tell you in short what has really happened in South Africa, which is like, in one sense, a big victory for the access to medicine movement. And it comes at a time when uh, otherwise things had started to look bleak because the TRIPS favor uh, a decision was like really a watered down decision that we saw. And there is there are also pandemic treaty discussions that are going on at the level of WHO and uh, at uh, global level. And uh, we are seeing that there is so much of pushback by the developed countries and the pharmaceutical, uh, uh, the developed countries and pharmaceutical companies as to not to have those provisions which can lead to access to medicines and treatments, right? Now, in that context, to have something as strong as this, 
is is uh, quite overwhelming uh, so uh, what has happened is that uh, uh, the uh, activists in south africa led by hji health justice international uh, they went uh, they asked the, uh, the government to uh, the, during when the covid was at, at its peak to really make uh, the contracts which the government had signed with various companies for vaccines covid vaccines and they asked that those contracts should be made public these companies were johnson and johnson pfizer etc uh, but those contracts were never made public and nobody knew what was contained in them uh, and uh, and it raised issues of transparency of accountability people knew that there are many problems with those those um, contracts in fact we had also reported for people's dispatch if you remember uh, in january 2021 because some of the contracts from countries like colombia and all were leaked and we saw that they had really problematic clauses so hgi took it upon itself went to the court in south africa and asked the court to intervene in this matter it was yesterday uh, it was uh, the day before yesterday on uh, august 17th that actually the court said the government has to make all the contracts of vaccination which were signed uh, between the government and companies for covid-19 vaccines they should be made public within 10 days so we are hoping that in 10 days we will actually have not the leaked versions but the versions which the government's put out to see uh, how the contracts were right jyotsna so to elaborate on this a bit further could you maybe take us through you know using the example of colombia but also generally what activists have been saying why were some of these contracts that were signed with big pharma companies during covid-19 problematic um so so uh, any uh, contract which is not made public which is used people's money is a problem that's uh, the principle but especially with regard to these uh, because the leaked contracts showed the terms on which the companies agreed to provide vaccines to the countries and which did not include only the countries of the global south it also included countries like the us and the uk and other european countries uh, and you if you look at the contracts you really feel that it was those weren't really agreed upon between the parties who were equal but the pharma companies are so much more powerful than even some of uh, the governments for example it questions sovereignty of the countries uh, pfizer's contract with colombia for example said um, that uh, if pfizer is providing uh, uh, the vaccine and the go- uh, com- uh, the government is buying it, it they are not giving it on discount or anything right if that is happening if the government is buying it from pfizer they cannot buy it from anyone else the government cannot decide to donate or sell it to some other country uh, if, if they want to it also had clauses like uh, the, of indemnification which is you have to put uh, uh, your national assets as collateral to the company in case something goes wrong the company actually can sell the national assets it has outrageous conditions like this um, and uh, also one of the major major problems is because uh, and they were all agreed upon under non disclosure agreements one had to sign that uh, before uh, getting into the contracts uh that uh, it is widely believed and people who are in the know how know it pretty well that uh the um, uh, price of the vaccines actually differed from country to country pfizer's and johnson's literally sold them uh, vaccines at whatever cost they wanted and they saw which country can pay more or is agreeing to pay more so wherever there was more misery of course uh, uh, the governments wanted more of the vaccines they were more desperate and pfizer made use of it uh, so in that sense uh, uh, if we see what this uh, uh, verdict has done it's something like this people are paying for these vaccines because when governments agree uh, enter into any of the agreements it is uh, through people's money so people pay for the vaccines it is they are to be used for people's health but people are not the ones who know what uh, is contained is in those agreements and they should know and this is what this judgment has done um and uh, we uh, we are hoping that this judgment will really pave the way for other governments uh, other countries across the world to make um, uh, the contracts uh, 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 public and not only for the covid-19 vaccines but all the contracts which are agreed upon between the companies and the governments should be put in public domain we should know how much we are paying for uh, medicines and treatments um, and uh, when we are discussing pandemic treaty which i mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning um th- th- some of these clauses should enter into these treaty discussions and be actually on paper and written in ink uh, in future if uh, there is any crisis of health 
Right, Jyotsna, thank you so much for that input. Very interesting points you mentioned. And I think it's a very important question you have raised that considering that taxpayers are paying for these vaccines, shouldn't they have the right to know what kind of conditions big pharma companies may be setting so that they are able to get what at some points are often life-saving drugs. We remember during COVID-19, vaccination was a huge problem, the kind of inequities that existed. And maybe this decision could be the start of similar things. So we'll hopefully get back to you when the contracts are officially out so that we can maybe discuss some of these practices as well. But thank you so much for now. Sure, thank you. And finally, it's time for the finals of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 that's being held in Australia and New Zealand. England and Spain, traditional powerhouses, will be contesting for the championship on Sunday. Now, this has been a very interesting tournament. Great football, huge attendance and a lot of interest. And some important questions about the future of women's football. To get a 360-degree picture of the tournament and the debates around it, we go to Siddhant Ani. Siddhant, we are at the very final stage and now we are at that moment where I think we can also, for one, talk about the football, talk about the incredible matches that have taken place, but in some senses also talk about some of the larger questions, the larger picture that emerges out of such an important tournament like the FIFA Women's World Cup. So let's first go to the sporting side, so to speak. So the finalists are decided, Spain and England, traditional powerhouses, the Australians must be disappointed losing out the semi-finals, also missing a chance the third spot because Sweden won that match. So, uh, take us quickly through the semi-finals and what lies ahead on, for Sunday's tournament. Finally. Uh, yeah, yeah, Prashant, uh, good, good to be back on DB. Uh, like, like you mentioned, of course, Australia disappointed uh, at not being able to you know, make it to that last stage. Uh, but I think uh, the... Uh, kind of support that the tournament has received here, at least on the, uh, in most of the cities and big urban centres in Australia, population centres, uh, will continue for the last game. There's, of course, a sizable English uh, also community uh, that, that lives in Australia and works in Australia. So, they, they will be out in, in full numbers. But what we saw uh, in terms of the quality of both those two semi-finals was, again, uh, taking it a notch up from what we've been seeing progressively uh, as this tournament has developed, I mean, England have, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, in one sense, like we talk about all the time, anyone but England, uh, it, it pains us to say this, but they have been superb and become so strong uh, the longer they have played into the tournament. The semi final against Australia was uh, such a fluid and controlled performance. I mean, they knew exactly what they were doing, and, and there, were, there was this magical goal from Sam Kerr, who has become. Uh, I think if uh, Kerr were to stand for Prime Minister of Australia tomorrow, uh, that vote would be won. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so so beyond that incredible goal, and Australia had a few other chances as well. But uh, but still, seventy-five plus thousand people were there in the ground, pretty much till the final whistle, uh, cheering them on and hoping for you know right down to to the end. Uh, some sort of, uh, you know, any excitement or even there for, to appreciate the effort they've put in to get through to the semi-finals and all of that. And for Spain, it's been a big battle. Twelve of their national team players actually uh, stood up uh, in revolt against the management, uh, the coach who is presently there as well, Jorge uh, Vildas, uh, who is leading this team. Um, they are 12, uh, out of those 15 players, 12 have actually not been included in the squad. So they will be watching uh, their teammates uh, play the final from back in Spain. While the issues continue to exist, they have not been addressed successfully by the Spanish Federation. And we've seen how, uh, Prashant, also that part of the story is something that has been uh, sort of, that resonates with women who are playing this sport across. Whether you're from the developed Western world uh, or you're from Papua New Guinea who played their first Women's World Cup, you know. The conditions which uh, with which uh, sort of the women's game is organized, handled, the levels of corruption, uh, the fact that there's very little safeguarding and also uh, mechanisms to sort of uh, address issues when they come up. Uh, so whether it's Spain and, and like, like I was saying, Papua New Guinea Federation, I was talking to a friend who's come down from there and they were talking about the kind of stuff that's, that's going on with, with their, their team as well. So extremely difficult uh, situation in which all of these teams have, have uh, sort of managed to get the sport to this level and many, many people who have played a sort of founding role in that entire movement actually unable to participate in these joyful moments and, 
and the part that you know the glory aspect of of sport uh, but i think many of them uh, are appreciated by the wider community and also there is an understanding that this is now with the kind of uh, explosion in terms of revenue money dollars that have that are being talked about with uh, regard to this kind of uh, women sporting events everyone will come in for a slice of that pie right so uh, for it to be any different structurally from what is happening already in men's football uh, those conversations are now starting to take place uh, prashant but well, nice that you ended with that point because i believe gani infantino the president of fifa also delivering a speech and also leading to quite a few discussions on you know what this tournament means for women's football as a whole like you said the whole question of you know whether it's going to follow exactly the patterns of men's football interesting questions which i think of course there won't be an answer immediately but some interesting debates it looks like uh, yeah absolutely absolutely prashant and it also shows like how uh, kind of with with blinders uh, sports administrators at these highest levels have been looking at uh, you know all the i think and this could probably apply to any uh, women's sport uh, it's always from a, a a male perspective and and how uh, the structures are and how those can be then replicated and lead to sort of building you know another property that becomes something that makes a profit like infantino in his speech among he said some uh, again as as is the norm uh, we remember the speech that he made at the uh, in qatar where he felt all kinds of things and and, and i think social media really uh, quite effectively uh sort of critiqued uh, that approach and and it's much worse here where once again he's reiterated that women and speaking to women that women need to convince us men what we need to do to change the sport etc etc is essentially uh, that a space needs to be carved out in the men's game uh whereas i think the women who have been fighting for this space to begin with are uh perhaps of the opinion that they can create their own space and they don't need to be attached to the same format after all fifa as well as these organized associations that control the sport in many countries have played uh, a pivotal role in ensuring that women's sport remain or women's football sorry uh, remains as um, underdeveloped underfunded under uh, whatever it is as possible it was banned in several countries for for many many years and you know federations had to act independently the world cup started unofficially it's only as late as the 90s that we actually had this kind of an event to begin with so if the structure is not already so entrenched then why not build a system that uh, also takes on the learnings from the professional game that men have already uh, that already happens in, as far as the men are concerned the problems with club football of which there are many and most are sort of finance and and that kind of uh, right and uh, so so create a structure that is uh, possibly more uh, equal more egalitarian or at least there's some semblance of it um, and uh, beyond looking at these showcase events prashant because close to 600 million dollars in revenue have been generated by uh, uh, the fifa women's world cup 2023 and yet uh, the fifa president tells us that they have barely broken even right so and this does not perhaps account for the expenses made by the city of sydney the government of new south wales so taxpayers money that has gone into various projects related to uh, this event and and so for example after that fi- uh, semi final in sydney when those 75000 people were trying to get back to wherever they were uh, there was a massive train breakdown uh, so uh, you know and these breakdowns are happening of course uh the people running the trains are saying that there was vandalism but if you look a little bit further the unions have been fighting against understaffing uh underfunding for security reasons and you know maintenance issues uh, not having enough people to do the kind of work that it requires to run a network and especially if you're going to get so many more thousands on that network uh, in a very concentrated period it leads to issues uh so so from a very uh that kind of micro level to a, a global level conversations i, I think uh, have been happening uh, prashant on a host of issues um of course when it comes to fifa and these organized kind of symposiums and conventions uh, the track tends to be what uh, what these guys want it to be uh, which is essentially very much focused on 
uh, building marketing and and those kind of things uh, but we 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 have to see how some of these programs pan out over the next few years uh, uh, yeah and and we have at least a, a fantastic final to look forward to because two top teams uh, playing prashant on sunday and uh, again uh, one more chance to uh, perhaps have some concluding conversations around this event Right, Sidan. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to the final and maybe have one more conversation, like you said, on the conclusions of this World Cup and what it means. Thank you so much. Thanks, Prashant. And that's all we have time for in this weekend episode of Daily Debrief. Don't forget to visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Don't forget to come to our YouTube channel, watch our videos from across the world of people's movements, of issues of geopolitical interest, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. See you on Monday.